What does Jack's Twitter account being compromised, Capital One's data breach, and Facebook's outage have in common? Well, every single one of these things are a failure mode of the internet today. So, but today, actually, let me make the case for how crypto is actually making the internet a safer place. And I know that your first instinct when I talk about crypto is to think about this. You think about the volatility, you think about the price action, you think about the Lambos. But the reality is that crypto is ushering a new era, era of research in distributed systems, in security, and in cryptography. And all of these technology advances are actually making its way towards the internet into a safer internet. So today, I want to talk about that narrative, the fact that crypto is making the internet a safer place. And the story starts 10 years ago. Before I started Anchorage, I ran the security team for a company called Docker. And I joined Docker after four years at a company called Square. At Square, my focus was on platform security, securing payments. And in fact, my first project was the little encrypted credit card reader that I'm sure all of you have used to at least pay for coffee. And it was 10 years ago that I met Jack. Jack was the founder and CEO of Square. And curiously enough, as all of you know, he was also the founder of Twitter. After following Jack's Twitter account for 10 years, I was incredibly surprised when on August 30th, Jack started tweeting bomb threats. Very much not in character for Jack. And even though the security team at Twitter immediately cleaned up the account, took over back control, it was incredibly interesting to me the thought that if the CEO of Twitter cannot have his account be secure, what hope do the rest of us have? On July 19th, Capital One had suffered a massive data breach where over 100 million personal records had been leaked from a database in one of those servers. And early in the year, I had been thinking about how Facebook in March had suffered a ma massive outage, and hundreds of millions of people out there did not have access to their services, but more importantly, did not have access to their own data. So now, I'm sure you're probably thinking, what do any of these things have to do with one another? What is the thread in common between all of these unfortunate events? What does Jack's Twitter account being compromised, Capital One's data breach, and Facebook's outage have in common? Well, every single one of these things are a failure mode of the internet today. The lack of personal security, the lack of privacy, and the lack of data sovereignty are things that we live on a daily basis with things that we accept as part of the internet. But it shouldn't be this way. And this is where crypto comes in. An interesting way to think about crypto, obviously, as we all know, it is a digital asset that has value. In fact, the crypto market cap of crypto is over $260 billion. The interesting thing about crypto having a price in a market cap is that with the rise in prices, a lot of other things started happening. In particular, the rise in prices has led to a rise in attackers trying to compromise consumer devices, their accounts, companies, and even attacking the protocols themselves, the underlying technology of the blockchains. And so what we unintentionally created that is incredibly interesting is the fact that crypto right now is the world's largest bug bounty. In fact, there are $260 billion ready for the taking. And the motivation for attackers to attack it has also fueled research into the cryptographic aspects of cryptocurrencies, into distributed systems, into security. And so the $260 million are not just motivating the attackers, are also motivating the engineers and the security researchers. And so within that context, let's see how all of the effort that is being put into cryptocurrencies are also helping us solve these problems and these failure modes of the internet. 
And let's start with personal security. So we go back to Jack's tweets. Jack started tweeting several things, including bomb threats. And when you see a hack like this of a CEO of a company, you immediately think this must have been a very sophisticated attack. It must have been a group of hackers that for months labored intensively to try to compromise a set of servers and a set of accounts. Well, it turns out that is not the case at all. What happened here was an attack called SIM swapping. Let me describe to you how this happens. Martine yesterday covered this briefly, but I'm going to go in depth to show you the technical complexity of doing a SIM swapping attack. If you're an attacker, this is what you have to do. You walk into a Verizon phone store. You have a fake ID, and you kindly ask the person on the other side of the counter to change their phone number to the phone that I have in my hand. As simple as that. You just have to ask. That is the level of complexity that this attack took. So now, this is very interesting because the large majority of people did not realize how easy it was to compromise the phone number of an individual. And there was actually so much media coverage on Jack's Twitter account being hacked that I actually proposed that we should change the name of the attack from SIM swapping to SIM jacking. I think people are going to remember it a lot better. And the interesting thing is that you're probably thinking, Diogo, I don't care about my Twitter account that much. But you know what you do care about? Your email, your bank accounts. It turns out that every single one of your current accounts uses phone numbers and uses SMS, not just for two-factor authentication, but really for account recovery. You know an industry that does not rely on SMS and phone numbers, and it's past that from a perspective of security? Crypto. Crypto has moved, because of the target on our backs, has moved towards keys as the mechanism by which we authenticate users. There's very few companies, if any, that still use phone numbers and SMSs as two-factor authentication mechanisms. In fact, the rise of crypto has led to a rise of the creation of new personal devices with the single purpose of managing private keys for consumers. And even though every single one of these devices was created to hold crypto, every single one of them can also be used for authentication and to protect personal accounts. And it's not just new hardware that crypto is forcing to be created. The current hardware manufacturers that you use, HTC and Samsung, have been adding features to their phones, crypto processors, that have the sole purpose of maintaining safely private keys on your devices. So crypto is not only pushing for new devices to be created that allow you to do easy key management, but it's also making the phones that are in your pocket right now safer, improving your personal security. So now let me talk to you a little bit about privacy. And let's go back to the Capital One hack. This is yet another one of those examples where you might think that this is a very sophisticated attack that is very rare and is very uncommon. But that's not the case. What happened here is there was a database. This was a database of all of the credit card applications from all of the users in Capital One for a certain duration of time. And they were unencrypted on a database on a server that belonged to Capital One. So what happened? An attacker compromised the server and simply downloaded all this private information, therefore leaking the data. So how can crypto help here? Well, let's go talk about one of the underlying technologies of crypto, which is the blockchain itself. The majority of you have heard of blockchain, and you know that the blockchain effectively is a ledger. It is a publicly available ledger for the world to see. Part of the reason why we do that is because we want transparency and we want trust. Everybody in the world should know that the ledger balances. And everybody in the world knows that no new crypto and no new currency is being issued, and every single transaction is happening because it should, not maliciously. However, if crypto did have a public ledger, that would also mean that you could see every single transaction, and you could see me sending money to Ben Horowitz over there. So crypto developers have had to come up with new mechanisms to protect this information. And what we actually want and what we've created is cryptocurrencies that still allow you to have the transparency and trust 
of knowing that the ledger balances, but without ever disclosing the details of each individual transaction. And there's a lot of cryptographic mechanisms and tools that allow you to do this. But one that I want to focus on today are zero-knowledge proofs. Zero-knowledge proofs, the best way that I have to describe them, are cryptographic magic. There is no other description for it. A party A can prove to a party B that they know a secret without ever sharing the secret. In fact, without ever sharing any more information other than they know the secret themselves. Let me give you a concrete example by using the example of passwords. So all of us use passwords on a daily basis. That is a particular terrible password right there. The thing that you don't know is that the way that you authenticate with an account in a bank account is completely ridiculous. A password is something that we describe as something you know. It is supposed to be a secret that only you know and that you use to authenticate yourself to a remote party. But you know how today usernames and passwords work? You simply share your username and password with the remote entity. So every time you log in, you're actually sending the password that only you are supposed to know to the remote party. That is absolutely ridiculous. And in fact, what happens is if somebody compromises the server, if somebody compromises the remote website, now they have your password. And in fact, this is one of the reasons why security experts always tell you never to share passwords across websites, because every single website has access to the password itself. And so zero-knowledge proofs allow us to solve these problems. And zero-knowledge proofs allow you to prove that you know the password without ever disclosing it to anyone. And in fact, if we generalize this principle, we have a very powerful tool. Let's go back to Capital One. What if you had an application form in which, instead of sharing your social security number, you could actually prove your credit score without ever sharing the social security number in the first place? What if you can prove your identity without ever sharing your name and address? If you are never sharing your data with a remote entity like Capital One, then there can be no data breach because they didn't have the data in the first place. That's how zero-knowledge proofs can help. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about data sovereignty. And let's go back to the example of Facebook. For a lot of people on the internet, hundreds of millions of people, Facebook is not just another service. In fact, for them, Facebook is the internet. It is where they get the news. It's where they actually communicate with their friends and family. And so when there's an outage, this is not simply an inconvenience. This is effectively having their data disappear from their access and having no ability to access the internet at all. Now, this is not a problem of Facebook itself. In fact, this is a gener generic problem of the way that we architected the large majority of the services on the internet. What we call this model is a centralized architecture. The internet was supposed to be decentralized. But across time, what we've done is we constantly choose one specific service, and we share all of our data with that service. All of our email is in one place. All of our pictures are in another place. All of our messages are in other places. All of them centralized entities. The obvious question is, what happens when the centralized entity goes away? Or when it goes bankrupt? And this is not a theoretical idea. Just last month, Yahoo announced they're shutting down Yahoo Groups. That means that tens of thousands of mailing lists and millions of emails might just disappear from the internet. And if you're not concerned of Yahoo Groups, think about Wikipedia. What if Wikipedia fails to fundraise the next goal? What then? So cryptocurrencies have been created from the beginning to remove these centralized single points of failure. And by doing so, they're increasing the availability of the internet and making the internet safer. And the other thing that cryptocurrencies are doing is they're giving you the data, the rights to your data back by allowing you to control who gets to see it and by allowing you to control who owns the data in the first place. So my ask is, the next time you think about crypto, let's move away from the Lambos. And instead, let's start focusing on how the technology that is underlying cryptocurrencies has impact much beyond digital currencies. In fact, the evolution of cryptocurrency is actually helping every single one of your devices be safer and therefore helping with your personal security. 
new cryptographic methods are helping secure your data and allowing you to finally regain some of your privacy. And now we're actually getting more reliable internet services, and we're finally taking our data back. So the next time you think about crypto, I would like you instead think about how crypto is making the internet a safer place. Thank you very much.